local law number 103. And the New York State Open Meetings Law your open meetings to be both podcast and archive. This meeting is being recorded today. I will now review the procedure for the LEICC meetings. For in attendees should be on department meeting to find the department. Uh, sorry, of health. See where meetings are open to the public, but the audience is during meeting. For a web based meeting, we will not be using the or the QR features. From the public, public. Comments will be added into the record at the end of the meeting. Then to make LEICC members, CC members introduce themselves. Uh, we can start with Lydia. Hi everyone, Lydia Lidniak, Assistant Commissioner, Bureau of Early Intervention. I'll pass it over to um, some um, to Chris, please. Hi, Chris Tan, Assistant Commissioner for Education Initiatives at ACS. Renee. I'm, I'm Renee Noel. I'm the, I'm the Acting Assistant Commissioner at the Bureau of Health Care, Department of Health. Uh, Jessica. Jessica Wallenstein, are you there? Okay, we can. Oh, okay. Jessica's here. She can't uh, get her sound to work right now. Um, Mary, Dr. McCord. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary McCord. I'm the director of pediatrics at the New York City Health and Hospitals Gotham Health Network um, and a member of the council. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Roseanne. Good morning. I'm Roseanne Saltzman, I'm director at Up We Grow. Great. Uh, Patricia Gray. Good morning. I'm Pat Gray, and I'm representing the LEICC through the Bureau of Early Intervention. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, Dr. Perry Asamni. Good morning, everyone. I'm the Associate Director of Pediatrics at Harlem Hospital. I'm the Pediatric Program Director there. Morning, thank you. Um, uh, Trisha DeVito. Hi, good morning. This is Trisha DeVito, CSE Chairperson, New York City Department of Ed. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, Jessica, were you able to get your sound to work? No? Okay, that's fine. She's here, Spirit, with us. Uh, Jessica's from the New York City Department of Education. Uh, she is the Senior Executive Director of the CSEs. So welcome. Okay, and we will have uh, folks that are doing presentations today introduce themselves um, as they uh, present. So with that, uh, Liz, uh, hopefully your sound is doing a little bit better. Um, what, where, what are we doing next? Okay, uh, we will now approve the minutes from the last LEICC meeting. Uh, will someone make a motion to approve the minutes? I will make the motion to approve the minutes. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, will someone second the motion to approve the minutes? Second. Thank 
you. Uh, now, please raise your hands to approve them. Uh, can you on the bottom, or you can go right next to your name, and you should get a little hand. Do you vote to approve the minutes? Okay, okay yes, great. Um, awesome. Uh, Dr. Perry Asomni, do you vote to approve the minutes? I do. Yes. I did raise my hand. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Oh, no, I'm just, you know, technology. Uh, Trish, do you vote to approve the minutes? Yes, I approve. Okay, great. So, motion to approve the minutes carries. Thank you, uh, oh. everyone. Thank you. And now we will move on to our next agenda item. So we will have Lydia Lednyak, Assistant Commissioner, uh, report on the SCICC, uh, the EI program updates, and the data report. Thank you. Uh, normally, uh, Nora Puffett uh, presents the data report, but she is uh, can't join us for this LAICC meeting. I will do my best to represent the data. Uh, so I'm just Putting that out there now. Um, okay, so first, um, I am happy to present on the um, State Early Intervention Coordinating Council, which occurred on December 15th, uh, 2022. Um, as with all State Early Intervention Coordinating Council meetings, I have remitted all of the materials from that meeting to all of the LEICC members uh, for their review. Uh, so, if there are any questions about um, any of the materials that I have sent, please uh, let me know. So, uh, this was the agenda that was covered at the last uh, state early intervention coordinating council meetings meeting. I will be discussing 4 of the items that was discussed at the meeting that I believe are most relevant to the New York city program. We were going to be talking about Bureau of early intervention administrative updates the annual performance report and state systemic improvement plan, um, where the State Department of Health is with telehealth guidance and uh, the provider uh, workforce capacity task force. I will have a broader discussion of the rate setting methodology task force um, meetings and, and, and conversations at our next uh, local early intervention coordinating council meeting. So, as far as state administrative updates, as far as the implementation of the EI hub goes, and just to jog your memories, the EI hub is the state case management system that will replace the current New York um, state case management system called NICE. Uh, so, the new um, date for EI hub implementation has not yet been announced, but the state continues to assure us that we will receive two months notice uh, prior to launch to ensure that we are ready to prepare. Um, the state also discussed the New York State Early Intervention Regulations. As you all know, the state released a regulatory package that will have some broad ranging impacts on the early intervention program in both the city and the state. Uh, many provider groups, including the New York City Department of Health, has submitted regulatory comments on those regulations, um, and the state is currently reviewing those regulations. Um, at this point, what one of two things could happen. If the state decides to make changes to their regulatory package that are substantial in nature, the regulatory package will get reposted for additional comment. If the state decides that whatever comments they received um, do not move them in or, you know, to make any additional modifications in the proposed language, the uh, regulations will be published and we will move toward implementing those regulations. 
The annual performance report was the next item I wanted to cover here with all of you. Um, and basically, it is a presentation on New York State's compliance with federal performance indicators. There was nothing uh, out of the ordinary in that uh, presentation except the conversation about one indicator, and that is a timely start date of services, which is referred to as indicator one. The New York State benchmark for timely services is set at 30 days. We in the city strive toward 15. The state target for compliance is 100%. Uh, with certain discountable reasons provided. Uh, so the state's compliance historically has been between 85 and 90 percent. However, the 2021-2022 compliance rate is at 70 percent for the entire state. The drop in compliance, according to the State Department of Health, is driven by family refusal of telehealth and the related uh, delays in um, initiation of in-person services. The state discussed um, something that the state Early Intervention Coordinating Council has been uh, advocating for for a while, which is to uh, issue clear guidance on the use of teletherapy in early intervention. Um, the state is finalizing uh, teletherapy guidance right now. Um, However, they did not indicate when the guidance would be ready. The state early intervention, the state EICC is hopeful that um, they will be able to review that guidance before, it, before it's issued broadly to the entire state. And before you, you will see um, the items that should be covered in that guidance document. The last item that I will cover today as it sets up um, a presentation that we're going to be talking about later is the work of the Provider Workforce Capacity Task Force. As I've presented to you all before, the goal of this task force is to develop recommendations for the Department, for the State Department of Health to increase provider workforce capacity to deliver early intervention services, including teletherapy. So, uh, the State Department of Health uh, released the competency areas for the delivery of evidence-based evaluations and services in New York State uh, last year. And the committee has subsequently drafted a companion document for implementation of the competency areas. And uh, we, the department and the rest of the SEICC is hopeful to see that it be released um, within this quarter. The committee has, is also partnering with an academic research team to review uh, all of the credentialing requirements for the professions who work in early intervention to see what recommendations can be made in order to enhance and build early intervention workforce capacity. And I believe um, Dr. Jacqueline Shannon is going to join us later today to talk about that project and uh, what the goals are. So I'm excited to have her here today. I'm going to move into early intervention program updates. Um, and then pause for questions before talking about the data. So you have all seen this slide before. I am hopeful that this might be the last time I need to show it though. Uh, so what has happened, um, you know, just last week, uh, Renee, correct me if I'm wrong, but on uh, February 10th, the New York City Board of Health voted to rescind mandates um, for vaccine mandates for early intervention and other settings. I believe that that also covers school and childcare and municipal and the municipal workforce. Um, thank you. Uh, so where we are now, um, and on the bottom of the screen, we have issued formal implementation guidance vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, rescinding of the vaccine mandate, as well as updates to um, isolation uh, protocols for early intervention. I'm going to walk you through those briefly here right now, but I encourage everyone to review, uh, review that guidance, 
particularly around the isolation protocols, which are uh, less restrictive, which are becoming increasingly less restrictive, which is ultimately good for uh, service delivery. Beginning in February 10th, 2023, staff working for early intervention provider agencies in New York City are no longer required to be vaccinated against COVID-19. The definition of staff includes employees, contractors, volunteers, and interns of the early intervention provider, graduate, undergraduate, and high school students placed by their educational institution with an EI provider as part of an academic program, specialists providing support services, therapy, special education, and other services with an EI provider, and people broadly employed by a contractor of an EI provider. So there is a requirement for ongoing maintenance of records. Uh, New York City providers must maintain records for staff, proof of vaccination as required by the previous order, covering the time period when the order was in effect, meaning December 20th, 2021 through February 9th, 2023. Vaccination is no longer required, but recommended, including booster doses when eligible. And ultimately, early intervention agency providers may implement agency-specific COVID vaccine requirements for staff and contractors. I'm going to shift over into talking about a little bit of uh, updates around uh, isolation, uh, COVID-19 isolation requirements. Children receiving early intervention services and EI providers and staff who test positive for COVID may attend or return to work at their center-based program or resume in-person services on day six if the following things are met, right? They have had, uh, they've been fever-free for at least 24 hours without the use of fever-reducing medication. All of their other system, uh, symptoms, if any, are improving and they are two years or older and can consistently and correctly wear a face mask between day six through 10. However, if they have two sequential negative COVID-19 tests 48 hours apart, they may stop wearing their mask sooner than day 10. So exception to this five day uh, isolation requirement is individuals receiving or delivering EI services must be excluded from in-person services for 10 days if they are two years um, older um, or younger, or they cannot consistently and correctly wear a face mask, or they experience shortness of breath or difficulty breathing while they had COVID-19. And so everybody always asks about, well, what do we do with COVID-like symptoms? And this is very common in various settings where, you know, child has a runny nose, what do you do? Um, which happens a lot. So children receiving EI services and EI providers and staff who have COVID-like symptoms. So if they choose to not get tested, in that case, they may return to their center-based program or return to in-person services on day six if they've got no fever for the past 24 hours without fever reducing medicine uh, and the symptoms are improving, or they may return to their center-based program or resume in-person services before day six if they've had no fever for the past 24 hours without fever reducing medicine and their symptoms are improving and they have had two negative COVID tests 48 hours apart either from a healthcare provider, if the individual is younger than age two, or by two at-home tests, if the EI child is two years or older, with the specimen obviously collected by an adult. I wanna shift a little bit to talking about what was in the executive budget now. Um, really, uh, there's really one item that I'd like to highlight. Uh, so the proposed executive budget uh, seeks to amend the New York State Health Care Reform Act. Okay, what is that? This act requires that certain third-party payers and providers of health care services participate in the funding of certain initiatives through the submission of authorized surcharges and assessment. This amendment is needed in order to implement the Covered Lives Bill 
passed in December on December 30th, 2021, which requires commercial insurance companies to remit $40 million annually into the state's covered lives fund, which in turn will be paid to cover a portion of the cost of early intervention services for counties and New York State, which would otherwise have been collected from private insurers. And as you all know, as of the beginning of uh, 2022, New York State uh, stopped billing private insurance for EI programs, but the money was not remitted to the counties yet. So um, there has been a concern amongst the counties uh, in terms of, of financial reimbursement. So um, obviously this is a very good thing, um, but additional clarification is needed about what time period this is gonna cover and what the municipal shares will be. We were disappointed to not see anything about early intervention rates in the governor's budget, particularly as it refer, relates to creating incentives for in-person services. I'm gonna stop here and see if there are questions before uh, moving on to a uh, data presentation. Go ahead, Patricia. I see your hand is raised, but I'm, isn't, that might be from before. Yeah, that's before. I'm sorry. I took it down. Sure. Roseanne? Um, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, we've been hearing about the EI hub for a, a really, really long time, and I'm just wondering, and you may not know, but, you know, is there a plan now to say, I know they're going to give two months notice, but uh, do you think this is going to happen in this year? Um, that I, think that that's, <laughs> I think that's an excellent question. I think that's a question that many of us have. Um, I know that the state is taking steps to move forward on implementation. They're working on data migration. They're working on a sandbox improvements um, that actually have come out of the work that we here have been doing with providers uh, in New York City and uh, you know, communicating that feedback back to the state. Uh, the state seems to think that it will happen in 2023. So, all right. And my other question had to do with the the new EI regs. So, do you have a, a sense of? I know there are two scenarios, and maybe it is going to go back to uh, getting more comments or making changes, or maybe they're just going to go ahead with publishing. But when do you think they'll be finished renew uh, reviewing the comments, et cetera? So, I um, we asked the the state that very question. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago. And the answer that we received is that it's currently with their legal, with their general counsel for review to reconcile some of the more substantive regulatory comments that were made. Uh, so I would think that, that, that we should be able to have some clarity on that, um, at least on that timeline uh, by the end of this month, uh, at hopefully at the state early intervention coordinating council meeting, which is which is going to come up Great. in the next few weeks. Thank you. Of course. Anyone else? Any questions about uh, the presentation? Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, the data report. Um, and here I'm going to do my best. Um, I'm probably going to present it different than Nora would. I'm probably going to talk about it from more of a programmatic standpoint. I'm happy to answer your questions. So this first chart, it really shows the New York City early intervention programs recovery from COVID. Um, and what you will see is that in March of 2020, uh, referrals to the New York City program dropped, and they really bottomed out in July, as you can see, right? Uh, but what I'm happy to report is that the number of referrals are almost equivalent in number than they were in fiscal year 2019, which is, you know, the, our benchmark for COVID recovery. In addition, what I will say is that because there have been some shifts in the New York City population, 
the rate of referral, meaning the number of referrals per 1,000 um, is actually higher in fiscal year 2022 than it was in fiscal year 2019. Specifically, in fiscal year 2019, 107 children of every 1,000 were referred to EI, in 2022, 110 children out of every 1,000 children were referred to the program. This is very good news. It is possible that we will, after this LEICC, we will sunset this chart, which also makes me happy. Okay, the, this chart here shows referrals to the program for July 2017 through December uh, of 2022 by borough. As you can see, the program receives typically between 33,000 and 35,000 referrals annually. That's where we want it to stay. That's, that's what we think the right number is. Um, and what we're seeing is expected recovery in all boroughs. And I want to also point out is that we're seeing appropriate recovery in uh, Manhattan, which actually seemed to have uh, been the most impacted in terms of e number of EI referrals uh, during COVID. This next chart shows new and re-referrals to the program by race. And we look at these data by race because all of our partnerships and initiatives are geared toward achieving equity in the program. And we use these data to tailor our initiatives. Our overall goal is for the population of children receiving early intervention services to reflect the distribution uh, for the entire birth to three population. And based on these data that you have before you, I would like to highlight two trends. The first is that historically black children have been referred to the New York City Early Intervention Program at lower rates than children of other races. Um, black children made up 21% of the birth to three population in 2019, yet they only made up 17% of referrals. What you will see is that despite the pandemic and as a result of our partnerships um, and interventions, uh, we have seen a significant progress in moving the program towards equity, with black children comprising 19% of all referrals um, to the EI program in fiscal year uh, 2022, which is excellent. And really, this improvement is not something that the Bureau does alone. Uh, this improvement is a result of the systems that we have put together, put in place with all of you, with our hospital partners, with nonprofit organizations, with child care providers, and with other city agencies. So um, thank you for uh, all of your all of your commitment to to achieving equity in the EI program. The other trend that we see is that the population of children broadly categorized as Asian. Um, we see that the birth rate. Um, has increased. So the number, meaning that the number of children birth to three has increased from 13% in fiscal year 2019 to 15% in fiscal year 2022. We are seeing that the, the number of referrals to the program has not caught up with this notable shift in the birth to three population for this group. So what we're doing is we are closely monitoring and looking at these data and we are starting to do a uh, landscape analysis to identify the proper partners and, and we are starting to enhance our outreach efforts in these communities. So this chart shows the number of general services by borough. The distribution is consistent here by borough. Um, when we look at these, uh, when we look at services by race, we are seeing a proportional improvement in the black population. But the overall story here is that services um, are not rebounding as fast as referrals due to the longer term, longer term impacts of COVID and the shifts caused by teletherapy service provision. 
This is our waterfall chart, which shows children, you know, which shows how children make it through the early intervention process. This percentage has been um, has has been consistent, um, and we are actually seeing some improvements with more children receiving services, making it to services in 2023 than in 2022, which is a very positive sign. The last chart here shows insurance status in the program, and this is, we are quite a broken record on this point. As we always say, it's impossible that 10% of children participating in early intervention are truly uninsured. And um, we have started discussions uh, with, the New York, with the New York State Department of Health about uh, what intervention we can put in place to impact this metric. Questions there? Okay, and these data are always remitted to the LEICC a couple of days in advance. So if you have any questions after the fact, please feel free to communicate that with our team. Thank you, Lydia. Okay, now we will have Patricia Pay, Director of Provider Oversight, presenting on the Provider Oversight Activity. Good morning. So the first thing I'd like to do is give you a recap of our results for the year 2022. So as you can see, let's look at the good news first. That's that middle bar. Those are the monitoring results for MDEs and evaluation compliance. And as you can see, it's, we've got very high, excellent compliance, and that's really good news. And we chuck up a lot of credit to the agencies for being able to reach that level. Unfortunately, as you look to the left and you look at ongoing service coordination, it's quite a different story where clearly we have a lot of room left for improvement. And only 52% of our agencies were able to reach the minimum required level of compliance. We believe that some of this is attributable to a lack of SCs, to the increase in turnover in SCs, to a lot of brand new SCs. And of course, when you talk about brand new SCs, that puts increased demands on agencies to provide more training and more supervision. And then going to the far right where you see the results for services, it's pretty much the same story. Only 52% of our agencies were able to reach that minimum level of compliance. What's concerning is that this is a significant increase in the percentage of agencies that are failing as compared to how agencies did between the year of 2012 and 2018. And I think what's important to note here is that this is not at all a reflection of workforce capacity. So moving on then, uh, we sent out a letter uh, earlier this year to the field announcing some changes to our provider oversight process. And I just wanted to take a moment and review those with you. So for over a decade now, we've been monitoring every agency every year. And based on this experience, we've decided that we're going to test out the potential for a two-year cycle. So provider oversight will review every agency in either 2023 or in 2024. And then at the end of 2024, we'll reevaluate and look at whether or not we stay with a two-year cycle or return to an annual cycle. Another change is that we will be reviewing all four service areas, just as we did prior to the pandemic. And then this last one is all about a new effort, which is facility compliance and quality audits. This is an on-site audit for facilities only, looking at the markers of compliance and quality as related to two things, groups and services within a facility. Again, this is only for facility, and all facilities will be audited once by the end of next year, 2024. It's specifically designed to be low burden to the on-site staff. We, they'll be looking at personnel files and having observations of classrooms. And then at the end, there'll be a short report 
of the results and any corrections that are needed. The type of reviews and observations that we'll be doing fall into two categories. First, how the facility works with parents and family. So the question of what is the level of engagement and collaboration with the family and how is the feedback with the family on the child's progress provided? The second type is about the services within the facility itself, including the staff qualifications, the staffing ratios within the classroom at the time of the audit, how the classrooms are set up, and then finally, the agency's compliance with the group-related regulations, at least as they stand at that moment. So those are the changes that we um, uh, announced, like I said, earlier this year. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So now we will have Dr. Jeanette Gong, Director of Intervention Quality Initiatives, presenting on findings from the BEI ACS focus groups and the service coordination professional development. Good morning, everyone. Today, I will share the findings from the BEI ACS focus groups. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank BEI's Deanna Gohotra and Mary Elizabeth Fashan, and our ACS partners, Christopher Tang, Angela LaBanca, Roberto Romero, and Chandra Kasun, for their work on this project. The New York City Bureau of Early Intervention, BEI, and the Administration for Children's Services, Office of Education and Employment Initiatives, decided to hold focus groups with the goal to examine the factors that impact the journey of EI children that are in foster care. The questions and selection criteria created by BEI and ACS were reviewed by the LEICC and by advocacy groups, such as Advocates for Children, Brooklyn Defenders, and Legal Aid. Recruitment, screening, and the focus groups were performed by CBER Strategies, a consultant. In addition, BEI recruited parents via our Text to Families texting program, and ACS and advocacy organizations assisted in the recruitment of foster care agency staff and caregivers. Group sessions were held with foster parents only, foster care agency staff that included case planners, case planner supervisors, and education specialists, and with birth and adoptive parents. Next slide. In the next set of slides, I will present common themes that were shared by all three groups. The first one is early intervention is seen as a valuable service and the goals of the program are understood by everyone. Two, birth parents have more buy-in when the foster care medical staff supported the evaluation or when the agency's medical staff explains the need for services. Three, once children are found eligible for EI and services start, foster parents are eager to participate in services and the communication between the therapists, foster parents and service coordinators flowed well. Next slide. One common theme heard across all three groups is the stigma of having a child with special needs or being labeled as special needs. And this delays referral to EI and or the initiation of services. Examples include one adoptive parent said, we don't want to label a child so early. One foster care case planner said, we have to be careful putting a child in EI services with a label that will follow them down the road. And one foster parent said, she, the birth parent did not want her child to be categorized as special needs or needing early intervention services. She said, oh, I don't want this, and refused to sign surrogacy to the foster parent. Next. In addition, more common themes across the group, groups include, five, the benefit of referral to the developmental monitoring unit for ongoing developmental screening was unclear to some. Six, reported timelines for surrogacy paperwork and the completion of the EI evaluations 
are sometimes misunderstood and miscommunicated by everyone, foster parents, ACS staff, and by birth adoptive parents. And seventh, surrogacy complicates communication and there can be misconceptions or misperceptions about surrogacy paperwork. Lastly, communication challenges were also reported. For example, some participants reported delays in services due to the lack of consistent and transparent communication. Some participants were confused about who is responsible for contacting the birth parent to determine if they want to be involved in the EI process and how involved the birth and foster parents should be in EI evaluations. Foster care agency staff are sometimes not clear on the 30-day EI evaluation timeline, and birth parents was concerned that signing surrogacy paperwork would result in losing control or influences over services for their own child. So in this next section, we're gonna review the general takeaways we've learned specifically from each group. So for foster parents in terms of referral, Five foster parents expressed frustration with not having access to information about the benefits of EI before identifying the need for it with the child in their care. Foster parents reported that it would have helped if information about EI was shared with them during the foster parent trainings. However, they were happy to hear about EI during their children's medical visits. In terms of evaluation, all foster parents reported being present for their EI evaluations, with most reporting positive experiences with the process. The EI evaluation team provided education on various techniques parents can do at home that would promote developmental growth for the child, even when the eligibility criteria for EI was not met. In terms of surrogacy, according to some foster parents, surrogacy paperwork may have been signed without the foster parent knowing. There were some instances that foster parents may not have heard the term surrogacy, but understood that there were some decisions that they could make for the child and others that were made by the birth parent. In addition, power struggles with birth parents were also shared by foster parents. It was reported that some birth parents were not in agreement with the EI referral or evaluation and refused to sign surrogacy paperwork. Some reported stigma being an issue, while other foster parents reported that birth parents viewed surrogacy as the child bonding too much with the foster parent. In terms of services, foster parents reported having a good working relationship with the EI therapist and the SDs once services began. There are some main takeaways from the foster care agency staff. In terms of referral, some report not being able to call regional offices or contact service coordinators. There is a misperception that EI services are completed by one big agency or entity. Several times, FCA staff emphasized the need to get updates on the status of EI services for a child in the form of a report or database. Therefore, some FCA staff were unaware of the data report that BEI has been sharing with ACS. In terms of evaluation, staff wants more updates when evaluations are completed, and they definitely want a copy of the MDE. In terms of surrogacy, there were many complaints of being pressured by service coordinators to complete surrogacy paperwork. FCF staff also shared that securing a surrogacy is challenging. Most birth parents choose to retain their rights to make decisions for their children. Case workers reported that many birth parents feel that if they assign surrogacy to the foster parent, they will not be updated on the child's case or they'll be less connected to their child. FCF staff, FCA staff also shared best practices in securing parent involvement, birth parent involvement. They suggested inviting service coordinators to the family team conferences where both birth and foster parents are present. Foster care agency staff support birth parents in retaining their rights to EI services and decision-making and are reluctant to bring up surrogacy to birth parents. 
especially when the parents are actively involved in reunification with their children. If a birth parent is unreachable or there are delays in reaching a parent, staff report that there is foster care agency's responsibility to ensure that the child gets EI services that they need and they will escalate surrogacy to court intervention. In terms of services, foster care agency staff feel that SCs do not understand foster care. Caseworkers reported not getting enough support from service coordinators in the following situations. One, continuing services when a child is reunified with the birth parent and moves to another borough. Two, continuing services when the foster care placement changes. And third, aging out of early intervention and transitioning to early childhood programs. ACF staff suggested collaborating more closely with service coordinators. So in terms of takeaways from birth parents, the, parent, the birth parents in our four focus groups actively sought referral to EI. In terms of evaluation, we heard that birth parents want to be included in the evaluation process, but are limited when evaluations are conducted in places where they cannot be, such as in the forced the parents' home. In terms of surrogacy, Sur surrogacy was not something that was explicitly explained to birth parents. These birth parents assigned surrogates for their children's services once EI eligibility was established. They have been informed that they could retain the parental rights to make decisions about their child's EI involvement, but opted to assign surrogacy to the foster parent to facilitate the day-to-day -day logistics of scheduling services and follow-up. One birth parent whose child is in kinship foster care placement recognized and appreciated the benefit of assigning a family member as a surrogate. The birth parent emphasized that she was always informed of her child's progress in EI. And in terms of services, birth parents reported that they had a good relationship with their SEs and EI therapists. So in the next section, we're going to talk about recommendations from each of the groups. And this is important because it's going to inform the next steps going forward. Foster parents recommended including information about developmental monitoring and the early intervention program in the foster parent orientation training. Also, explaining the role of surrogacy, even if the parents' rights are still intact. And giving foster parents the EI parents' rights handout with the regional office and consumer affairs number. In terms of foster care agency staff recommendations, they recommend creating an outline of EI timelines and EI process in a handout for FCA caseworkers. Include the caseworker as a recipient of the multidisciplinary evaluation when it's available. Designate certain early intervention official designees or ERDs or service coordination agencies to foster care cases. Invite the SC or EIOD to the family team conference and invite the caseworker or child development specialist to the individualized family services plan or IFSP meetings to facilitate communication between parties on the progress of the child. And train foster care medical staff on the EI process and how to support caseworkers to explain the benefits to birth parents. Birth parent recommendations include explain enrollment into developmental monitoring versus referral for EI multidisciplinary evaluations when completing the initial intake in foster care. Provide the option of surrogacy while completing paperwork at the initial case conference with birth parents. Promote EI evaluation and service delivery in an environment out of the foster parent home as much as possible while still supporting natural environments so that birth parents can be part of the sessions. Other recommendations include the foster care medical and clinical staff and outreach and support being performed by EI's medical director and provide professional training for EI service coordinators about the legal requirements for surrogacy options involving foster children 
how to improve collaboration with FCA staff, and engagement with birth adoptive parents. So what are our next steps? Now that we have this rich amount of information from the focus groups. So we reviewed the findings and initiated several projects to address the recommendations. For the finding that some ACS staff ACS staff might not fully understand the EI process and therefore may not provide accurate information to force the parents. Actions taken. BEI presented an EIO, EI 101 training at the ACS Education Forum in December 2022 and will work closely with ACS to identify ongoing opportunities to present. BEI shared It Takes a Village workshop flyer with ACS to invite foster parents to learn about EI in November 2022. These are remote EI presentations for parents that are performed in the evenings and on the weekends by our own BEI outreach unit. Any EI parent may register to participate on, in these trainings. BEI and ACS will also explore updating the EI content in the foster care training for their new staff. For the finding that stigma related to child being identified as special needs may delay referral to EI. BEI included messaging to reduce stigma in the EI 101 training presented at the Education Forum in this past December. BEI and ACS are exploring leveraging a trusted messenger, such as the ACS medical director, to provide ACS staff education about EI timelines and the significance of eligible children receiving EI services sooner than later. For, for the finding communication challenges between ACS and EI teams that slow down the process. Actions taken to date. ACS and BEI are including more EI contact information in the data report to foster care agencies. ACS and BEI are rolling out trainings for foster care agencies in the use of the data report in March 2023. BEI plans to update their internal dashboards to identify foster care involvement and contacts. The finding, foster care agency staff want more information about where the child is in the EI process. ACS and BEI are presenting draft slides on how to use this data report at the Advocates for Children work group in February 2023 and are preparing for a training rollout to foster care agencies in March 2023. BEI will be recommending that foster care agency staff receive a copy of the multidisciplinary evaluations when requested. So the finding challenges among birth parents to feel included in the EI process. BEI and ACS are recommending to conduct evaluations at foster care agencies or to include birth parents remotely via Zoom. The finding, EI staff does not fully understand the foster care system. ACS and BEI are preparing a training about the foster care system as part of the Service Coordination Professional Development Institute 2023 training series. The finding. Confusion about surrogacy slows down the EI process. ACS exploring, is exploring the timing of the surrogacy discussion with foster care parents with the goal of educating foster care parents at orientation. BI will be adding the status of birth parents' rights on the EI eternal dashboard based on ACS data, and BI will update the EI 101 training to emphasize EI timelines and will work with ACS to identify ongoing opportunities to present. So that's the report. That's our plans based on the recommendation. And are there any questions? It was a lot. It was a lot. Oh my God. It was it was really a lot. And you got some great information there, I think, Jeanette. Really very rich, as you say. Um, I know that you were doing some work and looking at 
initial service coordination and foster care, maybe separate from you, but, um, you know, as part of one of the things that the Bureau was doing, and I was wondering if um, that also kind of would lead into, you know, how uh, service coordinators are, a I know you're talking about some education, but ha the issues that service coordinators face in getting children through the, pro foster children through the whole process and securing services, et cetera. So, I mean, I think that would be part of it, right? So, um, Chris Tang, Christopher Tang and um, his team are currently working on creating uh, a training for the SCPDI series this year. Great. And and in addition, this could be um, something that we could look into as well as part of a training that the SC subcommittee of the LEICC mm -hmm. is going to be working on. Good. Okay. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Pat, I see you have your hand up. Yes. Hi, Jeanette. Good morning. Jeanette, Good that morning. was an excellent, excellent presentation. And as you were talking, I had I wrote questions down, but as you went okay. through, you answered the questions. Um, so okay. uh, especially okay. around the birth parents' involvement and what are some of the challenges that you you will face with the birth the traditional issues between birth parents foster parents and the agency and now the added caveat of ei so i i, I think it was an excellent presentation and thanks for the time and um christopher and staff and group really good awesome thank you Can I just say, I, I just really wanted to um, thank, you know, Jeanette and Lydia and, and all of your, you know, your team has just, has been amazing, you know, in getting this to happen and in the report and, you know, just, just communicating with us and collaborating with us throughout. And um, yeah, definitely very excited about implementing these recommendations. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So I guess I'm going to start um, talking a little bit about a brief update on the Service Coordination Professional Development Institute. Um, so just a little background on the SCPDI. The New York City, the New York City BEI and Hunter College Service Coordination Professional Development Institute, or SCPDI, was created as a result of focus group feedback we received from Black parents, service coordinators, and SE supervisors about what they felt would improve the level of quality of service coordination. Professional development training about family engagement, cultural sensitivity, and implicit bias, EI family-centered best practices, better communication and collaboration, and greater supervision was a major recommendation across all three of those groups. Service coordinators play such an integral role in EI's family's journey in the program. Whether they decide to stay in the program, their expectations about the program, and the quality of their experiences. In fact, service coordination is the only service that all families referred to EI receive. The SAPDI was created in partnership with Hunter College's Silverman School of Social Work. Dr. Patricia Gray is our academic partner at Hunter and is one of the main trainers for the SCPDI. Dr. Gray's dedication and work has really made the SCPDI a success. Professional development opportunities are provided for service coordinators, SE supervisors, interventionists, administrators, and quality assurance managers. So even though it's called the Service Coordination Professional Development Institute, we want to say that everyone can take these trainings. Trainings cover knowledge and skill areas delineated in the New York State Department of Health Bureau of Early Intervention, competency areas for the delivery of evidence-based evaluations and services in the New York State Early Intervention Program. SCPDI trainings may be used to fulfill the New York State DOE BEI annual requirement for professional development. Continuing education contact units are available for social workers, 
early childhood special education teachers, occupational therapists, speech therapists, audiologists, and physical therapists. In the last four series, SCPDI has provided training to 660 participants. Beginning in 2023, SCPDI trains will be offered once throughout the year. An email communication will be released in April regarding registration for any of the eight trainings being offered during 2023. These are the eight trainings being offered for 2023. As you can see, the topics range from creating IFSP functional outcomes, engaging and retaining families in EI, advanced SE supervision, fundamentals of case management, empowering parents and caregivers of special needs children, family center best practices, and reflective supervision. As we mentioned in the previous presentation, the ACS Office of Education and Employment Initiatives team will be performing a training about EI children in ACS for the first time as part of the SCPDI 2023 series. One train that's in the works for 2024 is a training by Danielle Herring, who is the EI Family Ambassador for United for Brownsville. The role of the EI Family Ambassador has proven to be successful in engaging and retaining families in EI. And Ms. Herring will be sharing her experiences with working within the Brownsville community. Are there any questions? Thank you very thank much, you. everybody. Thank Take you, Jeanette. And thank you for all that work. I, I just want to say, um, as a parent, um, and I've had a child in early intervention that, you know, this kind of in-depth work um, is very much appreciated, I think, by parents because we sometimes don't feel like, you know, you know, we, we feel safe sometimes or the as what came up labeling and everything. And I think, you know, having these, um, into, having people come in and really speak to you and find out what's going on with you really helps them to soothe their minds about going into early intervention and realizing how much of a benefit it is. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Okay, so now we will go on to uh, Dr. Catherine Canary, uh, Medical Director, and Dr. Catherine McVeigh, Director of EI Research and Analysis. They will be reporting on the EHR EI project update. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. As you know, and as you've heard uh, many of the previous LEICC meetings, the goal of this project is to increase referrals to the New York City Early Intervention Program and to improve retention in the program, which we're measuring as children who progress from being referred to actually being evaluated to determine if they're eligible for the program or not. There are two main components to the project. The first was, which has already been well established, was to develop an electronic referral mechanism that lives within EPIC, which is the electronic health record used by our partner healthcare institutions. This was a first as the only uh, method of referring previously was either by paper fax or by phone call. The second component was to institute a mechanism to permit the exchange of information between the referring healthcare facility and BEI with signed parental consent. This was also a first and has proven to be more of a challenge than creating the electronic referral. I think that's safe to say. We started with three H&H sites and have expanded to all the ambulatory pediatric care sites within health and hospitals, as well as three additional healthcare systems, which um, you'll see on the next slide. The next steps in the project involve an evaluation of how effective we've been in facilitating referrals and improving retention, as well as documenting our processes and challenges so we can share this initiative in other settings. For the most part, our pediatric centers are strategically located within neighborhoods with low referral and low retention rates, which historically have been black neighborhoods in New York City. So the graphic on the left of this slide is a heat map of the black population in New York, which shows higher concentrations of black families by the darker zip code boxes. Our 20 partner sites are denoted by the colorful dots, and you can see that they're largely located in or very near these neighborhoods with a high concentration of black families. 
The list on the right includes our 20 partner sites, 16 within health and hospitals, which were engaging in bidirectional data exchange as of um, spring last year, one each at Montefiore and NYU Langone, and two at One Brooklyn Health. These um, latter four came on board with data exchange in sort of a rolling fashion over the course of the spring through early fall of 2022. We're really happy to let you know that this project was presented in a variety of forums last year. Uh, these included a presentation in September at the annual Zero to Three conference, which was so well received that they actually requested an encore virtual presentation in October, and I think there were over 400 participants in that uh, encore. There was also a presentation at the American Academy of Pediatrics annual conference in October, and two presentations in November. One at the annual symposium for the American Medical Informatics Association and another at the City Match National Conference. Um, and next, Tina will be sharing data combined across all sites for the period from January 1st through September 30th of 2022. Morning. Uh, so, as Kathy mentioned, uh, our slides are showing the data for the referral period from January through September 2022, which is the period where, uh, as you can see from the chart on the right, we had a huge expansion of the EHRI initiative. Um, we had a total of 16. 51 referrals, so 1,651 referrals. 72% of those referrals included consent for bidirectional data exchange. Next slide. Um, as expected, uh, we see that there's about a two to one ratio of male to female children being referred, completely consistent with New York City data overall. Age at referral uh, really, uh, was clustering around 18 to 29 months of age. And uh, we have a good proportion, 85% of children who are Black and Latinx within our referred population, exactly what our targets wanted. More than 50% of the children referred live in high and neighborhoods with high and very high rates of poverty which um, presents challenges in terms of access and engagement in all sorts of care. Next slide. Um, and then looking at retention, which is the proportion of referrals that result in a completed evaluation, uh, we restricted the uh, sample to children who were referred through June 2022 so that we could see over time the proportion that made it through the uh, referral process. And these data are as of September 30th, 2022. Uh, and you can see that among the EHREI uh, referrals, 72% made it to evaluation by then compared to 79% in New York City overall. And that's where uh, the challenges of living in high poverty neighborhoods uh, comes in. And then just looking at the eligibility of the children who were evaluated among EHREI children, 55% were found eligible compared to 59% in New York City overall. Uh, and that's it for the slides, uh, thank you. Any questions on uh, the presentation? And I guess what I will add, um, this is Lydia, is that you can see how this initiative, this is one of the main initiatives that has helped us achieve both the recovery from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as well as um, has really made a huge impact in our uh, equity goals. And so I just want to you know, say thank you to our healthcare partners for um, all of their work and investment in this and in making this a success.
Thank you. Now we will have Lynn, founding chair of the Early Childhood Education and Arts Education Department and associate professor at Brooklyn College's School of Education. She will be presenting on building the early intervention workforce, examining requirements of interdisciplinary professional development and preparation. I am wondering if Jacqueline has joined us yet. Um, so, is perhaps what we can do is um, as we work on having Jacqueline become a panelist, um, mm -hmm. perhaps we can move on to our uh, DOE presentation. Okay. I will advance those slides, um, and and we will and she and Jacqueline will present just shortly after that. I'm sorry. Thank okay, you. No problem. Um, no would you problem. like to introduce uh, Clarissa? Please, thank sure. you. So we will have uh, Shannon Edison, director, um, senior director of early intervention, preschool special education and inclusion, and Clarissa Garcia, coordinator of early intervention, special education and inclusion team, uh, division of early childhood, New York City Department of Education. They will be presenting the New York City DOE early childhood transition and other early childhood updates. Hi, good morning. Thank you both Liz and Lydia. Um, I'm Clarissa Garcia, so I actually will be presenting since Channing's not here today. Um, and I'm happy to be able to share updates for the DOE's Division of Early Childhood Education. So, in the past, um, and David has shared with this group updates about the Division of Early Childhood's Early, Interven Early Intervention Transition Team. Um, since then, there has been a few changes. Um, so now the EIT team is now under a larger umbrella of the early intervention, special education and inclusion team. Um, so this is an exciting opportunity as it's an opportunity to bridge together work at the division that was previously done in silos. Um, and this team now is being overseen by our senior director, Channing Edson. So the structure of the team has not changed, but there are some updates. So now the team has seven transition coordinators who are supporting all 10 CPSC regions across the five boroughs. And um, sadly, Ann David has now moved on from the team and she is currently um, supporting birth through five special education um, system as a CPSC administrator. And I myself have, have also stepped in to this work by supporting uh, CPSC Region 4, as well as the, the rest of the team. Um, and so the team continues to do proactive outreach to families um, who are transitioning from EI to preschool and as well as promoting inclusion. Um, the larger team now works together to try to streamline this birth to five special education continuum. Um, and we believe that this connection has helped to ensure that children are not getting lost in the system. And also, as a larger team, um, we continue to strengthen our partnerships with key stakeholders, such as CPSC regions, um, the EI regional offices, and other internal and external parties um, supporting our families for of children with disabilities. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of our recorded information sessions, um, the EIT team continues... I'm sorry, I think we skipped a slide. Okay, never mind. My apologies. <laughs> it's it's okay, Channing. Just say say, you know, say what you want to say. <laughs> Sure. So, um, the EIT team continues to do the work that they have um, continuously done. Um, so, last year or this previous year, they were able. The EIT team was able to reach about 1,200 families who were uh, transitioning from EI to CPSC, and the transition coordinators continue to meet with um, EI regional office and support um, service coordinators in transferring families from EI to preschool. So previously we used to have live sessions. However, these sessions are now recorded. Um, so previously we used to have two se two live sessions, which one which was moving from EI to preschool and um, inclusive preschool options. That is now going to be recorded into one large um, 
recorded session. So it's going to be called Moving from EI to Preschool. And these recordings would be available in languages such as English, Spanish, and Mandarin. And the families can reach out to our EI to Preschool inbox or our helpline. Um, also with that, we have a recorded sessions for the document transfer system. And this um, is a DEC training for service coordinators. And like I mentioned before, it was form formerly a live training that's now recorded. And it's an opportunity for um, service coordinators to be able to have access to this, um, to this recorded uh, session without having to wait for a live session to take place. So it's going to be shared widely. Also, another opportunity that we are offering um, at the Division of Early Childhood Education is a professional learning opportunity to promote inclusion. Um, and so I had mentioned before, it's a year long series on the pyramid model, which is a um, multi multi tiered uh, system of supports um, that helps. Um, that helps train adults in using more inclusive strategies and birth to five learning environments. Um, and this training has also been shared with service coordinators as well as CPSC administrators. Also, some upcoming dates for EI to uh, EI referrals to CPSC. So now, children who are born in the months of July to December are able to submit referrals starting March fourth, um, and so the CPSC will be accepting those referrals then. Um, also, I wanted to share that our early intervention, special education and inclusion team will continue to work closely with service coordinators and CPSC to ensure that all children um, born in 2020 who need CPSC services are getting their meetings. They're getting their meetings to avoid any lapse in services. We want to be able that we are maintaining a continuity of services. Um, and as EI helps families pre prepare for the transition, I also wanted to remind everyone that DECE is growing our inclusive and special education options. And so as of now, we have 85, 44, 10 programs under our portfolio with new enhancements. And so we are just excited to have these programs as part of our division and even more excited to be able to offer families more options um, in the DOE. And as always, you can contact our team by um, calling the, the helpline directly or emailing us at EIDA Preschool at Schools. Um, we also have a direct link to our guide for early intervention to preschool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clarissa. Any uh, questions for uh, Clarissa? Thank you for that update. Uh, Liz, let us uh, go back and would you like to introduce Dr. Shannon? Yes, I will. So we have Dr. Jacqueline Shannon, founding chair of the Early Childhood Education and Art Education Department and associate professor at Brooklyn College's School of Education. And she will be presenting on building the early intervention workforce, examining requirements of interdisciplinary professional development and preparation. Great, thank you. It's really uh, brings me much joy to be be here and hearing incredible work that all of you are doing. So, and I'm excited to be sharing this current research project that I'm undertaking with um, some incredible colleagues. Um, so, just to let you all know, the our specific uh, project goal is to closely examine and research the New York State Institutes of Higher Education's requirements and regulations with the New York State Ed Office of Higher Ed and the New York State Office of uh, Professions. In an effort to enhance the quality of the educational preparation of current and future pre-service early interventionists across four key disciplines authorized to provide EI in New York, early childhood special educators, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech and language pathologists. And it is in hopes to address uh, New York State's shortage of early interventionists, including professionals from linguistically diverse backgrounds, and to build early intervention workforce capacity across these four key disciplines. Next slide, please. Due to the current New York State Ed Office of Higher Ed 
and the New York State Ed Office of the Profession regulations, standard curricular in early childhood special ed, OT, PT, and SLP academic programs in the institutions of higher ed uh, do not require students to learn about EI core competencies or engage in clinical experiences with infants and toddlers and their families in EI. Despite the educational policies recognition of the need for core competencies of, of personnel working in EI across these disciplines. And as a result, there continues to be a lack of college level EI course content, such as evidence based family centered practice, authentic assessment and reflective practice and uh, limited clinical experiences devoted to EI and the birth to three population. Internships in home and community settings do not typically occur and or are not counted towards students licensure or certification, which are counter to building quality uh, work for workforce capacity in EI. Next slide. So reviewing the regulations and making recommendations to inform both both New York State Ed Office of Higher Ed and the Office of Professions regulations towards certification and licensure to include EI competencies as well as the experiences with infants and toddlers from linguistically diverse backgrounds in the home and community settings is, is really significant. It will ensure that pre-service professional college students in these disciplines develop knowledge and the understandings of the EI competencies and gain direct experience with infants and toddlers in field placements in EI settings. It will also allow them to receive clinical opportunities to try out and integrate EI competencies into their work with culturally and linguistically diverse infants and toddlers and their families. And in turn, this helps to further build a high quality EI workforce. So briefly, um, this is a research team from Brooklyn College and from the New York State Institute of Technology. Um, I am the pr principal investigator and an associate professor of early childhood um, and special ed and have developed an early intervention advanced certificate in EI and parenting at, at the college. Um, Dr. Michael Bergen, who is the associate director of DRD Speech and Language Hearing Center in the Department of Communication, Arts and Sciences Disorders at Brooklyn College, as well as his colleague, uh, Sharon Bowman, Bowman, who is the program director of their graduate speech um, Department of Language uh, patholo Pathology Program within, again, the, the Department of Communication, Arts and S Sciences Department, our participating colleagues from Brooklyn, along with Beth Alenko, who has, uh, is our occupational therapy professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the New York S Institute of Technology, and my colleague, uh, Professor Karen McFadden, who is also a professor of early childhood special education um, in our department and currently the interim associate uh, faculty to the Dean in the School of Ed. Next slide. This research is being funded by um, New York City Early Childhood Research Network. Uh, the New York City Early Childhood Research Network is a project of the New York Early Childhood Professional Development Institute at CUNY. They bridge research, policy, and practice for early childhood educators. They create a space for research partners to collaborate with city agencies such as ACS, DOE, DOHMH and funders to provide evidence for better policies and practices for New York City's youngest children and their families. The Heising Simons Foundation is a funding partner that is supporting this research and will be working with closely with Donna Anderson, the executive director of New York Early Child Professional Development Institute, as well as Dr. Uh, Erica Yardi, who is their research associate. And uh, in addition to working closely with uh, New York City Early Childhood Research Network, we also um, have connected with the SEICC Workforce Capacity Task Force. And the workforce uh, mission is to develop recommendations for the New York State Department of Health 
to increase provider workforce capacity to deliver EI services to eligible children with the developmental delays and or disabilities in their families. And the task force projects include a reduction of 1600 hour requirements by from by one third to 1000 hours via the notice of the proposed ruling for the New York State Early Intervention Program on September 22, um, which issue of the New York State Register. The New York State Department of Health Bureau of Early Intervention's competency areas for evidence-based evaluation and services in New York State Early Intervention Program and its related companion document. It's established two subgroups, the Rate Setting Methodology Task Force and the Telehealth Task Force. They've reviewed um, this research proposal and the research team, our research team will be providing regular progress updates and uh, present final re recommendations to the SEICC in the fall of 2023. So to summarize, our research team will conduct a close examination, research and analysis of the rules, regulations, and requirements governing pre-service preparation in the New York State Ed Office of Higher Ed for certification in early childhood special education, as well as the New York State Ed Office of Professions for lic licensures in OT, PT, and SLP. We'll be submitting a report to the New York State Department of Health Bureau of Early Intervention through the SEICC Workforce Capacity Task Force with recommendations for regulations for certification or licensure in the four disciplines. This will require identification of the current regula regulations that should be updated, recommended language to update the regulations to correlate with the five EI competencies and evidence-based telehealth and family-centered best practices. Um, and finally, we'll include recommended inclusion of field work placements with infants and toddlers birth to three and their families in EI settings, such as the home community and ensuring there's also bilingual experiences as well. So, um, great, any, any questions for anybody? Pat, you have a question? Hi, Jackie, good morning. Thanks, wow. thanks for the presentation, um, and I, I like the information you presented. I have a question as it relates to, in the academic partners, we've been talking about all of the, uh, the disciplines that you've mentioned, but also social work. And I noticed that it was absent from the presentation. Um, given that we're always looking at family engagement, family inclusion, <clears throat> Um, understanding um, early childhood development or all areas that social workers are part of. We have been charged with the task of increasing social workers as um, social work students in the internship process also. So I was wondering mm -hmm. why social work was omitted from this conversation. At this point, we're, we just with funds, we are prioritizing these first four with the hopes of, you know, having guidance for other disciplines as well. So it was really a capacity issue at this point. But you're right. I mean, and and also these new certifications for, you know, people who are family therapists, all, you know, so there's there's a lot more that we need to be doing. This is sort of really hopefully a step just to kind of get the ball rolling. Yes, and I think that the, the state uh, workforce capacity task force wanted to primarily focus first focus on those disciplines that are most utilized in EI and then as a as a subsequent step, um, sort of definitely move into uh, the area of social work. So I think that that's that's why. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I, we're hoping that this will help build in the other areas too. Yes. Uh, other questions uh, for Jacqueline? Okay. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Very we much. look forward to Thanks. hearing more 
about uh, your research and about um, the findings that you that you come to. Yep, terrific. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, so now catching up. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we do not have any reports from the LEICC committees. Uh, do we have any public comments? No public comment was submitted. Um, I did. I do want to make one. Uh, I just want to say one thing. Uh, some I saw some folks in the chat are interested in these slides. All LEICC meetings are posted on the NYC Healthy YouTube page. So you can go and look at archives of all of these meetings um, and all of the materials that are associated with those meetings are posted there. So for anyone's interest. Thank you, Lydia. And so there are no public comments. So at this time, our meeting is adjourned. I'd like to thank all the presenters. Uh, today's presentation was amazing. We got a lot of information and I can't wait to hear the updates. And everyone, please enjoy your weekend. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye.